Welcome to Court Street United Methodist Church in the heart of the city of Rockford, Illinois. We're pleased that you have decided to join us for worship this morning. Now please join me responsively as we share in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing praises to God, tell of God's wonderful deeds. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek God's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. You asked and God brought quails. You gave you food from heaven in abundance. For God remembered his holy promise. Praise the Lord. Amen. things of the reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, the second book of the Old Testament, the second book of the Holy Bible. We begin reading with the second verse. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out 
into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what is, they are to bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? As Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up, and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? Or as the subscript says, Menach, for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Lord have faith, that the Lord have faith. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, good morning, Court Street Church members. Good morning, Court Street kids. Well, it's getting to be fall, and that means it's really beautiful, and the scents and smells are different. I've enjoyed some uh, apple donuts, and um, I'm really glad it's fall. And when it's fall, some of our insects have to find a different home. And they have to come in from outside for some good reasons because it's cold. Well, there's one bug that comes in that we don't really sometimes want in. It is the grossest, is the ugliest, it's the hardest to get rid of bug. It's called the cockroach. Now, isn't that interesting? This cockroach is bigger than all the other bugs. I don't believe a scientist uh, of insects really designed all these animals. 
But I want you to talk, talk to you about the cockroach. There are 30 breeds in America of the cockroach, 30 different types. That means that in the world, there are 4,600 different types of cockroaches. And we really, they, are, they can be a nuisance. They do remind us about one thing in the Bible though, but let's talk about them being a nuisance first. First of all, they are hard to get rid of. They can go fast, they can climb up trees, they can climb up walls, they are hard to get rid of. And do you know why? They can live a month without food. A month without food. And they like any type of food. They're not picky. They'll eat garbage. They'll eat crumbs that might be dropped on the floor. So if you're in a, don't want cockroaches, you have to be pretty careful with your eating habits. Also, they will even eat the glue off of a postage stamp. They'll eat anything and they can live for a long time off that. In fact, I've heard that you can cut off a cockroach's head and the rest of the body will live for at least 45 minutes. They just don't want to give up. Another scary thing is sometimes in the right situation, the head that was cut off can be living for 45 minutes. They're very hard to get rid of. They don't like to die. None of us like to die. None of us like to die. We want to live forever. We want to enjoy life forever. But the cockroach reminds us that eventually death will come. But there's a book in the Bible called Revelation. It's written by the Apostle John. And in that book, he tells us that life after death is a beautiful place called heaven. And in a dream, he saw heaven and he tells us about it. It's a place with beautiful lights. There's no sun. There's no electricity. The beautiful life is Jesus love. And you know what? It's a peaceful place. Have you ever been to a peaceful place like Hawaii or lake or an ocean? What well, took some money to get there? Might have taken a lot of money, like an arm or a leg. But to heaven, it's very easy to get to heaven. You have to believe in Jesus, that he came to earth, that God sent him to earth, his son, and that he died to give us everlasting life. Everlasting life. To live forever. Well, we might not be living in Rockford, Illinois, or in our house, and we might not be living around all the people we know and love, but we will be living in heaven. You know, recently there's been a lot of things in the newspaper and TV and ads about people dying because of the COVID-19. And sometimes I feel a little bit sorry and I wish people wouldn't talk so much about death. But if you're a Christian, you're talking a lot about a uh, life after death. I'm going to get my ticket for that trip by praying, being nice, telling him about Jesus and how he died for our sins. Amen and hallelujah. Well, it looks like I might need an exterminator and Mr. Cockroach is uh, going to be hard to get rid of. But let's recap our lessons from the insects. Be like an ant, be diligent, work in teams, work hard, never give up, prepare for the future. The caterpillar, get ready to be transformed. The bumblebee, be sweet like the good Samaritan. The ladybug reminds us that it's faith and not luck that's important. The lightning bug tells us, let your light so shine, you are the light of the world. Mr. Grasshopper, hop away from sin. Roly-poly, 
God is our shelter. The praying mantis, make sure that when you pray, you pray from the heart and just not with your hands. The mosquito teaches us to not be distracted and be focused and beware of the itch. Mr. Cricket sang praises of worship. And Mr. Cockroach, La Cucaracha, reminds us that we can have everlasting life. I hope you remember these messages. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us Jesus and for giving us everlasting life. And the Court Street kid said, Amen and Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to go into the hospital tomorrow and I want every one of you to pray for me um, so that I have a good time in the hospital, if you can have a good time in the hospital, and that I get healed real well. Thank you. You're in my prayers. Make me in your prayers. Amen and hallelujah. <laughs> New Testament reading this morning comes from the book, the letter to the Philippians. I'm reading in the first chapter, beginning with verse 20. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by speaking with all boldness, boldness, Christ will be exalted now, as always, in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents for this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, now hear, and now hear that I still have. This is the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We have been blessed with a new day, another day that we can rejoice and be glad in, and I welcome one and all. As we go into this uh, service today and this message that God has given me, I pray that uh, it will be a blessing to you as well. I um, read this, the, the, the um, pericope the scripture that we, that uh, our liturgist uh, Reverend Wang had shared with you earlier and uh, Exodus and Philippian um, in Exodus 16 you know we are looking at the people of Israel and um, God has uh, taken them through the Red Sea uh, in a mighty way I, I must say in a way that has never been seen before 
and they walked to the Red Sea on dry land, pretty much. And then the uh, Egyptians, when they entered it, the Pharaoh's army and Pharaoh, when they entered into that same space that the Israelites had passed through, uh, they became bogged down uh, by the mud and the muck and the mire that was there, and they were drowned. And uh, the Israelites made it to the other side of the Red Sea. That was a powerful work, one that nobody should ever forget. It's one that would have been burnt to my memory. But I came up with, after reading uh, this narrative, the idea that there was a sense of complaining that seemed to be a part of their living. And so I want to talk to you today a little bit from reading uh, both scriptures about the amnesia befitting circumstance syndrome, the ABC syndrome. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know. The Lord came up with that in my mind, and I tried to make sense of it in the sense of how I worded it. But amnesia is a partial or total loss of memory of some sort. Uh, in an old movie theme song once observed, it's the word, these words are said. What's too, pain, what's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. That sort of convenient amnesia is at the heart of this message. In, a, in, in the um, Christian Century uh, magazine, uh, September 9th uh, edition, uh, Reverend Cantina Washington Lephart wrote these words. She said there was a black... Uh, African-American um, um, hymn that was sung at funerals most of the time. The lyrics were a testament to a fragile life, um, yet there were no complaints. In other words, here's the words, some words from that song, and it's titled, I Won't Complain. When I look around and I think things over, all of my good days outweigh my bad days. I won't complain. And I just wonder, and as, 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 as my dear sister in Christ also asked that question, is it realistic for, a human, to hum, for humans never to complain? Is it one's faith in God's uh, proportionate, is one's faith in God proportionate to how much they resist the urge to grumble or complain? In other words, um, is our faith in God a, a proportionate to how God has proven God's self to us? And if it is, then... Uh, we should resist the urge to complain naturally because if you just look back historically in the book in the in scripture in the old testament i mean i we got all kind of narratives where uh, people were saved out of fiery furnaces uh, people were saved out of lion dens uh, you know uh, he, uh, you know and then when you fast forward up to where jesus came he walked on the water he fed the neighborhood with a peanut butter sandwich, and that's a joke, but you understand it was a large crowd. There was no way two fish and a loaf of bread was going to feed them all, but some kind of way, and that was, just a, that was just a number of men. So God has done some wonderful, powerful things, and, um, and, 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 and then you think about what Jesus did to put the explanation, the ex exclamation mark there. He came, he came out of the grave after three days in it, and we call it Easter. He resurrected gave us a new life and a new way of living. And so when you look at all that, the people of Israel just came through the Red Sea. Uh, being led through the Red Sea, um, being led out of slavery into freedom, uh, the attraction with the, the life that they had in Egypt kept causing them to continually look back at the life they had in Egypt and they had just come through the Red Sea in a mighty way through God's mighty hand and they just seemingly forgot if you will, convenient amnesia, what God had done. Not in any kind of way, but in a mighty way. The faithfulness and the promises of God are no match for their, um, for their discomfort. In other words, they had more discomfort than they had in the, in the, in the faithfulness and the promises that God had made and had really kept. Um, all they could do was complain. And so I want to talk to you today about... Um, how it's about the mission and it's not about the meal we're always looking what's going to be our satisfaction and we don't ever look at the bigger picture which god has got a mission for our lives the israelites were like an army on a march having reached the sinai desert after god's stunning victory over the egyptians in the red sea and like most armies the first thing they did once the danger passed oh listen to me now once good times were back um you know was to start complaining 
about their 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 portions, their their food, their menu, their their meals. They didn't have a lot of food like they had before they got caught out there in this particular situation. What they forgot, the amnesia that they that came about was, however, was that the menu or the meal was less important than the mission. God was leading them to a promised land, to a new home and freedom. And that journey had begun with a meal. The meal was not the core of the issue. The meal was just the beginning. The Passover meal, it was designated to be eaten in a hurry while in, while in biblical combat dress. In other words, they were ready to move, which should have given them a clue that they were on the move towards something different and new. The meal was going to be uh, expedient and sometimes sparse as it would often be for any army or any uh, group of men or women that were moving towards some goal and had another destination or object in mind. But God promised to provide a steady supply chain for the march. In other words, God always had their back. In other words, the meal might not have been as eloquent and, 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 and as uh, uh, elaborate as they would like, but God promised to feed them. They would never go hungry. I'm going to rain bread down from heaven for you, God said to Moses. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. By providing this daily ration, God was going to test whether the Israelites were going to be good members of his army, if you will, and trust God. Doing what God instructed them to do. Or if they were going to simply keep whining and pining for the old ways of living. And I think we, we can hear in, the, in that message the echoes of our own personal lives. How God has moved us out of bad spaces and spots and places in life. And how when we got fat and happy again, we decided to have convenient amnesia. And we would forget what God had done for us. And we would start complaining about what we don't have now. By providing the daily rations that God provided, God was going to test whether they, the Israelites were going to be the good soldiers that he called them to be or, and to trust him and doing what God instructed them to do or were they going to complain about the old way of living. The meal that God provided for was bread and meat, manna and quail. Quail in the evening and manna in the morning. The bread and the meat, however, would only last a day. That meant that they were not to store up for the future. No stuff in one's pocket with more than anyone else. You got enough for just what you and your family needed and that was all you collected. From that day forward, think about this, for 40 plus years, the Israelites had manna day after day, year after year. God never dried up the supply of manna and quail. However, after the, uh, the novelty wore off, after the the, the whole idea of the man and the quail coming down being a really a miracle. It says that um, after a while, didn't tell us exactly when, I would dare to say not long, the Israelites ramped up their complaining about manna and the quail to the point that God sent snakes to quiet them up. And that's part of that narrative on that journey in, in, in the desert. There was, um, they ran into a brood of snakes. And as you know, God told Moses to take a snake that was made out of, um, uh, you know, uh, bronze or something or gold and to raise it up. And everyone who looked at the snake uh, that was on this pole, and it's the same symbol that they use in medicine, um, that they would be saved from the poisonous bites of the snake. That was a symbol then to talk about how he was going to raise up Jesus Christ in the midst of our desolate life. And how everybody who would look to, the, to Jesus Christ, who was raised up after he died, then they would be saved. All of this was to be a reminder of the glory of God who had the power to bring them out of Egypt, away from their, their life of slavery and sin that caused them to be burdened and, 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 and over, overcome by grief. Moses and Aaron reminded the Israelites as to who was really in charge and that God had their backs and wouldn't let them down. Getting to the promised land was the mission and the destination. Remember that. Getting to the promised land was the mission and the destination. And the meal had really was not the center core of that whole idea. That is so true today for us. We think that we have to have everything we want 
and eat as much as we want and have the best of everything we want. And yet the real destination is to live this life to be to the life that we're called to go to. And the destination is with God for eternity. That is the mission. And so I want to talk to you about one thing that we sometimes neglect and overlook that God provides. The point of the story, however, is that God provides for our needs, not what our wants are. We might want something bling, flashier, something bigger, something better, something that is the best. But God's more cons most concern is about giving us what we need so that we might keep moving toward the larger objective of the future that God has planned for us. The bigger goal is to get you home. It's always tempting to want to go back to Egypt, go back to that stuff I used to do. That which is more familiar, that which I've come to figure out how to navigate around and through, even if it's inconvenient. To go AWOL on our covenant with God and to seek an easier and more predictable path is what our always our urge and our, our inkling is. Even when, it's path, when that path leads us back into slavery of sin and death. Something very inconvenient, I must say. But the Christian life is all about trusting God for our needs. So that means that that means when I when I say that line, trusting God for our needs, you can replace that word needs with what your wants are. And that's where your problem arises. That's when you have the problem of the ABC syndrome. Amnesia befitting to the circumstance at the time that you're having a problem with where you are and where you want to be. Your father knows what you need. Before you even ask, says Jesus. And my God is fully satis fully, will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, says Paul. In other words, God's got what it takes to get you where you need to go. And he can do it no matter what it is that you need. Some of us have very little according to the material standards of this world. Some of us have a lot. Some of us are rich in relational and spiritual resources, while most of us struggle with both of those. But the question isn't how big our stuff is, how good it looks, or how much we have stuffed in our pockets. The question is whether or not we're willing to follow God's lead in our lives. Israelites found that after that hardship and manner complaining, that they were right where God wanted them to be. Now, isn't that something I'm, I, 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 that, that, that just, that just kind of had me shake my head and rethink my own personal life. Sometimes when I'm wrestling with what I want, not what God says I need, I sometimes want to go back to some inconvenient path in life, which I know is inconvenient. I don't know why I have this amnesia problem. If I go back there, I know I'm in trouble. But sometimes it seems like it's easier to talk about going back because I don't like what I got. And then I miss out on what God is trying to provide for me. And uh, I, I, I miss the whole purpose in my life. It causes a lot of trouble. So I find myself standing right where God wants me to be, but at the same time complaining. That's not good. The same will be true for us if we stay faithful and keep following God, no matter what we find in the gar garage and I'm saying that about sometimes we go to our garage just looking for a specific kind of car on the, on, or what's on the plate or what's in our pocketbooks. It doesn't matter. And you say, well, how does that work, Pastor Kale? Well, when we live in the love of God, there will always be enough. Always be enough. I want to close out with this statement from the reading in Romans. I mean, a reading in Philippians. Paul writes to the Philippians in first chapter, and, and I would like to title it, What Matters Most in Life. In our lives, and this is where I'm going back to this thing about us complaining all the time about stuff we have and don't have and what we think we want and what we do really need, God knows. The Wi-Fi is down. The coffee machine at work doesn't work. You order decaf latte, but, they, but you got a, a fully leaded Americano instead. This is how we begin with some frustrations that are so minor in the grand scheme of things. 
The Apostle Paul's experience in a jail in Rome helps to clarify what's important and what's not so important. He's in prison, waiting to be uh, tried and crucified in this case here. Uh, we know ultimately he did get, uh, you know, he got, he, got, he got persecuted. And so he was going to get a penalty of death, but he was waiting. And while he was waiting, he wrote this letter. And Paul, in effect, urges us to remember that there's a future accounting for our lives before God. And that should be the only thing that matters. Did we follow God in the plan that he had for us as we go forward towards a destination? Did we follow the mission plan and not look for the meal? And there's also crucial days of decisions and change in our current existence. There will always be one thing that will be sure. We will have change in our life. And there will be decisions to be made. I, I, he, God said in his, in his word to the people of uh, Israel when they got on the other side, the, the, before they got to the uh, promised land, they were about to enter. You know, this day I want you to choose life or death. And he didn't try to put them in a position where they had to guess what door. What's behind door number one? What's behind door number two? What's behind door number three? He told them, he opened the door and said, I want you to choose the door of life. Paul, in effect, urges us to remember that there's a future accounting of our lives before God and that all those days that are ahead in this life that we live are changes and also decisions to be made. The difficulty in choosing between the mocha and the frappuccino is barely a level one problem. Deciding what to do about the needs of a suffering neighbor and the call of Christ are level 10 issues. To live is Christ, to die is gain. That's Paul's, that's Paul's rally cry as he goes toward his end. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, is what he says in verse 27a. What matters most in life? That is life and death, following Christ into eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God with joy of a father and the heart of a mother, you created our world and everything in it. You called it good and claimed every creature as a precious and every person as holy. We carry the mark of your blessings in every kind word and every generous act. But tender God, please forgive us for we have offended you. We have sat, sat in your heart and turned your joy into tears for the world, insist on solving difficulties with violence and persist on ignoring the poor and shunning those of different color or, di, di, or, di, or belief or practice. Holy God, we pray for ourselves and, and a rebirth of charity. We pray for leaders and a touch of wisdom. We pray for the common folk who sit within range of mighty weapons and destruction. We pray for new possibilities of peace and for the fresh windows of hope and change. We pray for courageous voices who question, implore, and urge peace. Caring God, we know you are always working for good in this world. May we be a part of the march to peace. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Man. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer at this time. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, name. thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, us give us this day, day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the, power, and and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen.
Receive this benediction, my dear brothers and sisters. My friends, no matter how reluctant we may be to serve, be assured that we do not serve alone. No matter how dim we feel our light may be, know that we shine brighter because we go forth with the light of Christ. Remember that no matter where we go or what we do, we do so with the certainty that God has called us by name and we are his. Go forth, therefore, in the love, grace, and peace of God through Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen.